He's the lead guitarist of one of the most iconic bands of the 1980s and selling millions of records worldwide. Lead guitarist Mr. Paul Dean of the band Loverboy. Paul, how we doing, my friend? Hey, JT, I'm doing great, man. So, Paul, uh, take us back. Where, where did you grow up, and who were your major uh, musical influences growing up? Well, growing up, we had one radio station where I was. I was raised in the mountains of British Columbia, and uh, we had one station in Spokane on a clear night. So I had my little transistor radio, and I, it was a country station. So that's kind of where I cut my teeth on was Johnny Cash and that kind of stuff. And uh, then I got... Uh, I got a trip into Calgary twice a year, and I would I would raid all the record bins. And uh, at that time, we're talking uh, early '60s when I first started playing. I know, <laughs> way back. <laughs> so, how did you meet up with the other guys uh, that became the band Loverboy? Well, I met Matt in 1974. I was in a band in Toronto, which kind of self-destructed. We were together for three or four years, and as you know, people just got disinterested and left. And so I was kind of last man standing in, in T.O. with my with my wife, and uh, I had a really good friend in Calgary, and I phoned him and he said, is there any bands looking for guitar players? I mean, I looked in the one ads, I was like destitute. I had no gigs, and uh, so I went, oh, I know this guy in, in Calgary. I'll give him a call. So he said, well, there's this band in Edmonton, actually, that's looking for a guitar player. And that was Matt's, Matt's band. Yeah, I, they were called Great Canadian River Race. So I went out and auditioned, auditioned for them and they sort of auditioned for me I guess they probably didn't look at it that way but I was seriously watching them as well and I was blown away by Matt he did a solo that night I was just and he's still doing this incredible solo every night when we play it's the guy is scary good man he's so good it just gets better and better all the time how did you guys come up with the name lover boy I've always wanted to ask you guys that well I was sitting around uh, I was living in Calgary at the time um, you know, in songwriting mode and whatever, just looking for, you know, ideas. And that particular night I was in uh, band name mode. I, I I tried the name. It was just Mike and me at the time. And uh, this was like Matt, had, Matt, as I was saying, we got together in 74, but we, I, we, uh, we were in a couple bands together. And I split from, from that band. So I was on my own, and then I met Mike in Calgary. And anyway, so I'm sitting at the table. I was in band name mode, so I'm looking at the cover of some magazines, my wife. Denise had a bunch of uh, magazines. I'm looking at the cover girl. Oh, that's uh, cover boy. Cover boy. That's a pretty good name for a band. I, that's what's, oh, wait a minute. And then obviously Lover Boy. I went. That'll be good because I, I tried out. Uh, I tried the name Dean Reno Band or Reno Dean Band or Paul Dean and Mike Reno Band or something like that on my on my on Denise's little brother. Uh -huh. And he kind of rolled his eyes and went, well, yeah, whatever, you know, and walked away. <laughs> So I think, okay, i got to get something that's got some flair to it. Now, love it or hate it, it's a pretty good name. I mean, there's a lot of people, they kind of roll their eyes when they think Loverboy, but that, it's, especially in the early days. Yes. But, of course, of course, now it's like, you know, when I heard the Beatles, the, that name, I went, what kind of name is that for a band? But after a while, you forget about the name and you just associate the music with it, and I think right. that's what's happened over the years. Right. We, pe pe people know where we stand musically, you know. How did you guys come up with the song Turn Me Loose? Like, how, how was that song invented? playing with, uh, we were auditioning a lot of drummers, and Mike had this bass line. Doom, 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 doom. Actually, I think it might, if, if you were to look back, I think it he might have got the inspiration from um, a Queen song. There was a similar line in there, but wherever it came from, it was, it was such a great line. And uh, so every time we, and we were just jamming, we had nothing else, just that bass line, and then we kind of got a little bit of a groove going. One time, uh, we, were, we were auditioning a drummer, and just for fun, I picked up the bass and Mike picked up the guitar and I started playing the riffs and the drummer got in the groove and Mike started playing the guitar. I remember sitting down in a, in a club. Um, Lou Blair was, uh, he, he was supporting us in the early days and, and let us rehearse in this uh, warehouse out behind his, his club that he owned. I remember Mike and me coming in and sitting down and writing the lyrics in about, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes, just bam, 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 bam. Just, and I can also remember when we were recording it or, or just uh, writing it for the first time. Mike and I had been through a lot of a lot of bands, and a lot of managers, and a lot of record labels when we met. We were just getting tired of being told what to do and told what we can't do, and and uh, we were we were feeling the, the totally feeling the rebel spirit that that at that period in our careers. Because we, and uh, so I remember we were playing the tune, and Lou Blair was standing about. I don't know, 10 feet away, just listening to us, just just kind of grinning, just our cat grin. And I remember looking him in the eye and going, got to do it my way or no way at all. Just out of, just came <laughs> out of the blue. I don't know where the line came from. It just says, I'm, you know, I'm really tired of the BS that we've been handed, uh, and and Mike would would totally agree with that, that we've been been handed through the through the business end of it. Right. So that's, that's where that came from. It was like huh. totally from the 
from the heart and from the gut, and it was like uh, you know the the, uh, the one finger salute kind of statement. <laughs> Great, and you use it in the song. What a great song that was. And I know we're going to be uh, marking the 30th anniversary of the second album release uh, titled Get Lucky, uh, which became the band's best-selling album, which included another great song that uh, still can be heard on many, many rock stations all over the world, uh, the great rock anthem Working for the Weekend. Were you guys just uh, ready to party on the weekend one one week, or how did you guys come up with that song? Well, I had the I had the melody and kind of the structure think well you know i don't to be to be honest I, now that you mentioned i don't remember what what came first but i remember walking in vancouver walking down by the beach one sunny afternoon and in on wednesday and it was deserted i couldn't believe it i mean i was living in the in the heart of of a very busy section normally of, of town not downtown but just off downtown in kitsilano i'm walking down there by myself just i don't know it's about one o'clock in the afternoon well, where is it by the way where is everybody what are they <laughs> waiting for the weekend or what you know that was that became the the starting point for the song was everybody's waiting for the weekend and uh so we started working on it and writing it and uh we were getting close with all the parts and uh, i remember writing the the uh the melody on my guitar uh, in a hotel room in Montreal, just kind of the germ of it. And, uh, and we rehearsed it in, a, in one of our roadies, had a, had a garage out behind his his, uh, his house that he let us use for a while. We were out there bashing it away and trying, okay, let's try this chord, that doesn't work, let's try this chord, it's kind of random random chords and all, and this isn't working, this isn't working. So finally all, it all came together and we were... So we were in the studio, a real studio, rehearsing it, and uh, Mike came up with, so what do we call it, working for the weekend? I went, that's cool, sir. Actually, I like that better than working for the weekend. It's got a little bit of a twist to it, you know? And Mike came up with a couple other lines. Um, I think he said, do you want a piece of my heart? You better start from the start. You want to be in the show? Come on, baby, let's go. <laughs> uh, at, at Mike, uh, or Matt wrote one line. He says, will he come out tonight? I think was his, his line. And, uh, yeah, and the rest of it was... Uh, is what you hear. Taken from the band's third album, uh, one of my personal favorites, the Keep It Up album, uh, the highest charted single off that album was a great track called uh, Hot Girls in Love. How did you guys all collaborate and come up with that tune? That wasn't real, really a collaboration. I was, I was in, uh, we, we'd done, uh, we played 200 shows that year leading up to that, plus we were doing in-stores every day and radio station visits and, and just insane amount of work. So we we would we'd been working pretty much a year straight without a day off, maybe a couple of days here and there. So we'd done a we'd done a tour, we'd done our our get lucky tour, opening for Journey, and uh, which was an amazing experience. And we finally got a break in December. We took December off, and I I went to uh, we went to Maui for for a month. A mo- had a month off in in Wow, home. you can imagine that. Nice, was pretty incredible. And it was just. At that time, recording uh, equipment had evolved into the portable cassette four track. So I was, this is great. I'm, we can go to Maui. We can lay back, and just do whatever we want, and maybe it can do a little bit of song writing. And uh, so I had my four track, and as it turned out, it rained every day. Wow! Every, every day. day? Wow! Every day. Every day. So uh, we spent uh, quite a bit of time indoors, and but it was still, it was still. Very mellow, a nice, beautiful place to be, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wrote the tune uh, there. Was the next hit single, uh, Love in Every Minute of It, was that written by the producer, uh, Mutt Lang? It was totally written by him, yeah. Okay. And, and, and the story there is we, we wanted to, we were looking for a, a, a great engineer. We, we were, are, were and still are huge fans of Def Leppard. So I'd, we'd, we'd, heard, uh, we'd heard that Mike Shipley was, was their engineer, so we hired him, and he wanted to produce, co-produce the album. So he, he came on board. It turned out that it, that uh, it wasn't what we were looking for production-wise, but he, he brought some really great uh, uh, mixing and recording ideas to the band. Of course, Mike it was and still is one of uh, Mutt Lang's uh, primary uh, engineers. Mm-hmm. So we were we were going along, and I guess uh, Mike and his Mike Shipley and his wisdom. He said, uh, you know, I really like the tunes you got, but I think we we need another single. And you know, who am I going to argue? <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're all, always open for a great song, you know. And uh, so he phoned up Mutt and he said, so "You got anything for these guys?" And and Mutt, uh, around three or four days later, he called us up and said, "Okay, I got this tune." So he played it to me over the phone. And uh, I slept on it. I heard it like right now. I went, this is great. I said, but now we're, we're, we want to record it. Can you, how, how can we do this? So, I, so, I says, so he said, well, 
you can you can hook it up through the phone. You can record it. I mean, this is way before internet, way before shipping MP3s or anything like that. And we were we were in the middle of of recording uh, a Love and Every Minute of an album. And uh, so he he said, here's what you do, and blah blah blah, and, he, and you hook up the wires and everything. And so we got the tech at the studio to hook it up, and so we recorded it off the phone right onto a. Uh, I think that originally. He played it over the phone, and I held my little ghetto blaster up to it with the, the little microphone up to the speaker. Uh-huh. So we kind of got, I could play it for everybody, so we could go, everybody could see if they liked it. You know, of course, everybody slept on it, loved it. Right. And uh, so, but it, we couldn't hear what the bottom end was doing, because it was all just, <laughs> you know, just, just <laughs> trash on the top end. But just enough that we could make out the vocals and the melody and that. But we didn't know, didn't know what the bass and drums were doing, really. So we called him back and said, can so we need to get a better copy of this, but we want to. We need it now. We can't wait for you to, to FedEx it. It take like two weeks to go for, come from England to, to you know to somewhere in the middle of Quebec. Yeah. <clears throat> so he, he anyway he explained it, and so we wired up the phone and we recorded it directly off the phone and went. Oh no! So that's what they're doing. Okay. Wow. Okay. And we and we played that. We we put it onto cassette, and Matt played to that cassette, and that's how we got the. That's how we started. It. That's how we got the drums down for that. The next tune, Paul, and this is this is the great reason why I, I do these interviews, because every radio station across America, in Canada, and Europe, plays all these great songs from the 80s, but they don't take the time to have you guys present the songs to us and tell us, you know, the stories behind the music. I think that's what brings the whole entire show together and the whole entire elements of the 80s um, are the great behind the stories, uh, behind the music stories, you know, that you guys can tell. Right. Yeah, that's the, I mean, it's the best part. I got a, I got another one for you if you want to talk about uh, This Could Be Denied, which is also a really big hit. It's right? next on my list, Paul. Go for it. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> we, we, had, we had heard a, uh, the first digital album was, uh, was uh, Donald Fagan. He had put out, to, to our knowledge, it was the very first all-digital album mm-hmm. that he put out that, that was released. And we made the... Uh, it was a very bold decision at the time. Tom and I, we decided we're going to make this an all digital album. So we we rented a a couple of uh, twenty four track Sony machines, brought them in. Cost a friggin' fortune. Oh I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> how, how, how expensive these things were. So anyway we rented them and we we got all the beds down. Something happened with the with the take cause like I say, this was the you know, really, really early days. Mm-hmm. And whether whether it was operator error or whether it was a design flaw, whatever it was we got all the all the tracks done, and it was sounding and feeling amazing. It was really good, but they were full of glitches and dropouts and noises and oh. cr- crackles and pops. Our road manager, uh, Doug Grover, he took the tapes, found a found a restoration place in L.A., took the tapes down there. It took them two weeks, to, and they they were able to restore them and clean them up, transfer them over to some some, some other tapes. And so in the meantime, we're just we're working. They're old school. We're doing analog stuff. We're just kind of working on the on on the trying to get this could be the night written properly because mm-hmm. we worked on that tune and uh, worked it to death. And uh, it was it had uh, probably ten different versions. And I finally got together with Jonathan King from Journey. I went down to down to his house in San Francisco, and I, I says, "Can you help me out with this thing? I'm really I hit the wall with it. I love the melody, and I got, I got a great verse, and that's it." But I, I think there's a real potential in this too. So he, he da 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 da. I mean, if that's not that Jonathan Cain right. lick, I don't know what. Right. That. So he, and plus he laid down the groove for it. And I, oh, this is really good. And then you guys had the opportunity to become a part of the soundtrack to Top Gun with the great track called "Heaven in Your Eyes." Um, how did that all come about? Just trying to remember the name of the guy. I'm sure it's. I'm sure it's written down somewhere. <laughs> it's. Uh, I don't know what I can do about that. I, I'm going to have to look it up. If you if you want the if you want the goods, I'm going to look it up in my iPad right now. Okay, cool. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, and it's and I, and I know Paul. It's so weird that all this stuff was you know 30 years ago. I can't even I can't even believe that. <laughs> well, neither can I. That the fact that we're able to to keep playing these tunes and people still want to hear these tunes and uh, yeah, we still get we still uh, uh, tour on. It, North America tours and play sixty, seventy shows a year. Right, uh, and it's it's truly unbelievable. Yeah, it really is. It really and, and it's so weird that all the kids these days. I mean, that's what their parents grew up on. So that's what you know just goes down to the next generation, which is great. 
That's true. We get a lot of kids out to our concerts singing all the words and that. Okay, I got the story straight now. Okay. John Dexter was uh, was uh, uh, is a songwriter. In, I, don't, I think he's probably still living in Vancouver. He, he had written uh, some pretty good songs, pretty good songwriter. And he came to us with a an earlier version of Heaven in Your Eyes. It wasn't completely finished, and uh, and he he had came he he'd been working with a writer named Mae Moore. He, to be honest, I can't remember what shape the song was in, but all I remember is that uh, Mike and I we sat down with it and we finished writing it and. Uh, then recorded it uh, at Mushroom Studios. It's not a not a real big story, but uh, I tell you, doing the video was a blast. We did it in the, I think it was the something or other Star Theater, Star Dust, or something like that in uh, Nashville, and uh, it was a it, it was during actually during a concert, and they they filmed the whole concert and and used little excerpts from different shots of uh, different parts of different songs and put them in, and then took some of the. Uh, Took some of the the footage from the from the movie, um, uh, at Tom and Kelly, and uh, put that in. That was that was a pretty cool thing to be uh, to be involved in that. I remember uh, Mike and, and I and uh, it's either Lou or, or Bruce or maybe all four of us went down to L.A. and we had a meeting with Jerry Bruckheimer and uh, a major uh, producer of still of killer movies. Uh, um, Pirates of the Caribbean series comes to mind. But anyway, we played the tune for him, and he was blown away. Yeah, that was a really exciting time to have him go, this is great. Yeah. Definitely going to use this. Um, so I remember going to the movie when it first came out, sitting through it, waiting for this, waiting for, uh, sorry, waiting for uh, Heaven in Your Eyes to, to come out. I knew it was on the soundtrack, because mm-hmm. the soundtrack, I think, was probably pre-released. It was already out. So I'm sitting there waiting for it to come up. I'm thinking, okay, now it's going to come up in the big love scene. It's going to be, <laughs> oh, it's not there. Okay, it's going to be, for sure, it's going to be on the jukebox in the bar scene. Uh, uh, no, it's a Righteous Brothers. Oh, okay, well, then they're probably going to play it on the credits as it rolls out. Uh, nope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a bit weird. Oh, it was on the soundtrack of the, the movie soundtrack, but it wasn't in the movie. Um, and then one of the last uh, '80s hits that you guys released as Loverboy, uh, Notorious, was that was was that a little bit of help from uh, John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora? Is that how that story goes? That's right. I, I went out to Jersey to write with those, with the guys on uh, Bruce Fairburn's recommendation, and the connection there was I was uh, we were recording. I can't remember what I think we were recording the Love and Every Minute of an album with Tom Allen, and Bruce Fairburn was across the, well, in Little Mountain, it's like a, com- it had, at the time, it was a complex of three or four studios, and two large studios, and then a couple of overdub studios, and Bon Jovi were, were next door, and I sort of had, had heard of Bon Jovi, but nothing nothing much, and I remember, apparently, the, the, the story was that they wrote a couple of the tunes on, on Slippery When Wet. They were planning on writing for, for Loverboy, and I guess Bruce uh, said, uh, what, are you crazy? You can't give those away. you got to keep those for yourself. But I remember Bruce... Uh, calling me aside, I just went over to say hi to him, and he says, hey man, sit down, I want you to hear a couple of tunes, and he played me uh, Bad Name and uh, a couple other ones, and I was blown away, these are great, he says, can I have these tunes? <laughs> <laughs> and and he said, I can't, I, I may have said that jokingly, but, uh, right. so that was, the, that was the connection there, so I got to meet the guys, and uh, I just, we figured, you know, and I'm going to go out to Jersey and see if I can write some songs with these guys. And we wrote uh, three or four tunes, and uh, Notorious was the uh, was by far the best song. I, I remember John's uh, uh, contribution, big contribution was, and you can just hear it. It's just, it's John mm-hmm. Bon Jovi. It's na 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 Notorious. And it's so funny that, you know, John and, and Richie were a part of that song and collaborated on that song because I never knew that, to be honest with you, Paul, until just this afternoon. And I always kind of felt that that was a huge Bon Jovi influence tune, big time. It just well, it just sounds like go. something that would be on, you know, Slippery and Wet or their New Jersey album or something like that. It was just, uh, that's very cool. Very yeah. cool. Paul, are you working on any solo projects right now or just exclusively with Loverboy? Or what are you kind of working on right now? I started working on a solo album. I had a I had a solo album. Uh, Matt and Spider and I recorded it in Dallas at, at a real good friend's place. Uh, Mike Pistersi has a beautiful, world class recording studio in Dallas. Uh, but you know, I recorded it, and then it's a funny thing because we recorded after shortly after we recorded that, I, and I worked on it for a while, and I did, did the vocals, and it's pretty much it was pretty much ready to go in terms of being written. I hadn't finished doing all the vocals. We since then we recorded a couple of tracks, new tracks. Uh, you might have, may have heard one called Heartbreaker. We recorded a couple of new tracks with 
we got back together with Bob Roth, which was an amazing thing because Bob has had incredible success since we worked, worked with him last week with Metallica and Motley Crue and Bon Jovi and on and on and on. He's done so much. And he came to us. He, he, he says, I got this tune, Heartbreak. If you guys would like, I'll send it to you and you can have a listen. So we sent it to Mike and me and we went, oh man, this is killer. We did a, we did a little demo of it and uh, sent it off to him and, and Bob says, yeah, I, I thought this would work. As well. When I heard this song, I went, this is Mike all the way. This is perfect for Reno to sing. So Bob said, yeah, I like what you guys did. Okay, I got another one. You want to hear it? And I, I'm like, yeah, uh, yeah okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So he said that one to us as well, and it's called No Tomorrow. And it's unreleased, sitting in the can, ready to be, almost ready to be unleashed on an unsuspecting world. Oh, very cool. Well, it's always good to have uh, unreleased material and then, you know, promote it and uh, throw it out there to the world and uh, see the response. It's always a good thing. But to, So to get back to answer your question, I just, I kind of, kind of, just got blown away so much by Mike's performance. I went, why do I even want to do a solo album? Mm -hmm. Why, why bother? Right. When I when I'm working with the, the one of the best singers in the world, and uh, I'm we I, we did a I did a demo with Mike. I, we'd we'd done all the all the you know we rewrote the tracks the the demos that, that Bob sent us and added added some guitar parts and uh, just kind of rearranged them to make them more. Completely lover boy, and that the next next stage was uh, Bob said, "Okay, uh, can you demo the tunes and let me hear what let me hear Mike sing them?" So I went to Vancouver and uh, went to Mike's house, and we set up in his little studio and we recorded the tunes. And I was I was the, I was the lucky guy. I was one of the lucky ones that day because I got to sit in the actual same room and hear Mike sing his butt off, sing to these two these two songs. So that was a real exciting day for me. I know it sounds like bro romance but whatever it's it was an it was an incredible feeling even today 35 or what 34 33 years later it was an incredible thing for me all this time later to sit in the same room with mike and and working on a new song and have him just to hear him sing right just like that like raw in the room it was i mean i'm 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 uh, his biggest fan, you know. Yeah, that was that was a really great day for me. That is great. Well, Paul, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Well, that's great. Uh, me too, man. I uh, hope you get some stuff you can use. Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, if anybody out there would like more information on Loverboy and Paul Dean, uh, you can always check out their website at loverboyband.com. Paul, thank you so much. All right, JJ. I'll talk to you soon, man.